that uh, this talk is going to be delivered by uh, Sudhir K, who is uh, working in Cypress Semiconductors as a senior principal engineer for systems. So Sudhir has more than uh, 20 years of experience, uh, both in the embedded system design space and uh, software implementation for system on chip. And he has worked on various uh, technologies, uh, for example, wireless LAN physical layer, audio algorithmic development, multimedia codec implementations, device driver development, application development for codecs. So uh, uh, you can see that his experience is uh, wide ranging. Uh, so he has worked uh, not only as a technical leader, but managing entire life cycle of projects from the time of uh, project definition to the time you deliver it to the customer and then entering the product into a customer support phase. So while he is working at Cypress, uh, before that he was in Broadcom and he started his career uh, with uh, ST, I mean, ST Microelectronics and Texas Instruments, but he started his career with uh, IBM as a software engineer. So with this uh, short introduction, uh, I would like to invite uh, Sudhir to uh, take it forward. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Arvind. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, uh, coming straight to the uh, topic of the day. Uh, so in this presentation, what we will go through is the basics of Wi-Fi 7. Um, but even before we go into the basics of Wi-Fi 7, we uh, will also have a very quick uh, look into the journey of uh, how Wi-Fi actually has evolved from the beginning. And so that uh, uh, it will be easy, uh, you'll be able to appreciate uh, more on how Wi-Fi 7 came about and what are the unique features of Wi-Fi 7. And then we'll try to explain each and every feature and what is the relevance of uh, that feature in Wi-Fi 7. Okay. Yeah. So coming to the timeline of how Wi-Fi evolved, right? So if you go back uh, somewhere, uh, 1999 may be a better uh, way to start uh, the Wi-Fi thing. So initially when Wi-Fi came, uh, it used the uh, CCK and D DSS spectrum technology. That means uh, complementary code keying and DSS. So it at, at this point of time, the bit rate was very less, 1 Mbps and 2 Mbps. So when we say DSS, it is like you spread the spectrum. So a single bit is uh, uh, spread out across the spectrum and that is what is transmitted. So the bit rate was much lower, 1 Mbps and 2 Mbps. And uh, later it got enhanced to 5.5 and 11 Mbps, but still that was the uh, fastest bitrate which you could get. Then came 11A, that is when uh, OFTM came into picture. That is, uh, so it, till now the Wi-Fi was operating in 2.4 uh, gigahertz band, that is the ISM band in 2.4 gigahertz. And then they opened up the 5 gigahertz band and this was a very huge band. I mean, in the sense, the total band was approximately one gigahertz in bandwidth, approximately there, uh, compared to two gig, which was like hardly uh, 80 megahertz. Uh, the range was almost there. Uh, I mean, it is only 80 megahertz. So the number of channels were less, and uh, the so five gig that was one of the biggest advantage. So when five gig uh, band was opened. OF, uh, Wi-Fi shifted to OFDM. So OFDM has its own set of advantages over the traditional method. One is the bitrate started, bitrate is now much improved. It went up to 54 Mbps. And second thing, OFDM by itself has its own advantage because of cyclic prefix and the guard interval, whereby uh, uh, the intercarrier, uh, inter symbol interference and intercarrier interference, all of those were taken care. So that's one of the advantages which OFTM brought into the table. And of course, 5 gigahertz was a much cleaner band compared to 2.4 because 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, remember, had uh, all sorts of interference and uh, even Bluetooth and all, uh, all the other uh, standards also sitting in the same spectrum. So that advantage was there. So OFTM again was also brought into uh, 2 gigahertz as part of 11G. So if you see, uh, typically, if you see a router, right, it will be written as 
802.11 abgn those kind of thing that abgn stands for this 11a 11b 11g and 11n so uh, that's the convention which was followed earlier now next came 802.11n so after 802.11n right the uh, wi-fi standard as such they started naming it as wi-fi 4 5 6 and all those stuff because this was a slightly more confusing for a few of the people that what does A stand for, what does B stand for, and all those stuff. So one of the advantages of 11N, right? One is the mega, uh, the bandwidth of the channel. If you see till now, the ba channel bandwidth was only 20 megahertz. Now it started shifting to 40 megahertz. So as a result, now you have a slightly wider bandwidth. It is almost double the bandwidth. And then not only that, uh, this 11N was common to both 2G and 5G, and it had the uh, it introduced the concept of MIMO. So MIMO, uh, the full form is uh, multiple input, multiple output. That means instead of a single antenna transmitting one string, you now have more than one antenna. Say in, in case of two antennas, you can have both the antennas transmitting at the same time, and even on the receiver side you can have more than one antennas receiving at the same time. And this is what was the concept of MIMO. And what MIMO brought into the table is you're you are taking advan advantage of spatial multiplexing and that spatial multiplexing will uh, enhance your uh, bit rate. So that is one of the advantages which MIMO brought into the table, onto the table. And that was brought, uh, that was got as part of 11M, which is Wi-Fi 4. So uh, those were the key things which uh, 11N improved. Then came 11EC in uh, 2013. So what happened as part of 11EC is uh, a couple of, uh, I mean, I'm only highlighting the key features, not all the features which were part of 11N or 11AC or any standard, but only the few key ones. So one of the feature was the beam forming feature. So in case of beam forming, uh, what it, meant is uh, you could uh, focus the uh, your beams in a particular direction. What this enhanced is that now you could uh, uh, enhance the range of the uh, device because you, uh, instead of just transmitting all, in all the direction, you are now focusing the beam at a particular direction and that will ensure that you have a wider range. Then second thing was on the downlink, uh, so when we say downlink and uplink, so think of it in this way. So there is an AP or the router which is sitting at the center of your house, and then there are multiple devices like your phone or a laptop and all those stuff. So whatever is the communication which is going from the uh, router to your devices, that is called as downlink communication, and whatever goes from the devices to the AP or to the router is called uplink communication. So in case of in 11AC, it also introduced downlink multi-user MIMO. So multi-user MIMO uh, may already have been introduced by this time in uh, in the uh, wire, uh, in the uh, in the cellular spec, but uh, in Wi-Fi it came as part of 11AC. So what we mean by multi-user MIMO is in a single uh, instance, the uh, router in the house, I mean, uh, the router or the AP as we call it, can communicate with multiple end user devices. And that has its own advantage because now you are saving time and making more efficient use of the spectrum, right? So this and beamforming uh, were some of the key features which 11AC brought to the Wi-Fi standard. And apart from this, if you see the bandwidth, it again went up from 40 megahertz to 80 megahertz. So as the bandwidth increases, if you remember the Shannon's formula, right? Your the bit rate and capacity, channel capacity, everything goes up. So as a result, now because you can just imagine bandwidth as the width of your pipe, right? So now you have a much wider pipe compared to what it was in 11A or 11G standard. So next came Wi-Fi 6. So Wi-Fi 6, which was uh, formally released in 2019, uh, the first thing which you notice is 160 megahertz bandwidth, which is 
again doubling from whatever was present in 11 AC, but it also brought in the concept of OFDMA, which is more important. In Wi-Fi 6, one of the main thing is more than the throughput, what they focused on was to improve the network efficiency and improve uh, the user experience because one of the thing which uh, came about is even though Wi-Fi had improved the speed and uh, by 11 AC, we could uh, reach almost up to close to one gigabits uh, per second and all those stuff. One of the uh, thing which came out was that in congested environments, uh, the throughput was hit. So to address some of those shortcomings, so there were a lot of enhancements which were put in as part of 556 or 11AX as we call it. So the first one was OFDMA. So if you take a 20 megahertz or a 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz bandwidth, so even though it's an OFDM which has multiple subcarriers, uh, it was always transmitted as a single chunk. Now with the concept of OFDMA, right, you can bundle only a few carriers. For example, you can bundle only 26 subcarriers and call it as a part, uh, call it as resource unit. And you can only transmit 26 subcarriers to one particular state. And you can use the rest of the subcarriers to communicate with the other devices. So this was the concept of OFDMA. That means given, even if, for example, even if you take a 20 megahertz channel, so what you will do is you will use only a part of the channel to communicate with one device and another part to communicate with some other device, so on and so forth. So that was the, I mean, I'm just kind of simplifying things here, but uh, overall that is how you can picturize OFDMA as. And then the second concept it brought on uh, to the table was uh, uplink MU-MIMO. I remember as part of 11AC, downlink MU-MIMO was supported. That means an AP can trans uh, can communicate with multiple devices at this. I mean, it can trans transmit data to the to multiple devices at the same time. Now, as part of uplink MU-MIMO, what happens is multiple devices can trans uh, can talk to the AP at the same time. So even though at the same um, uh, instance of time, there are more than one device which are actually go, uh, transmitting to the AP their data and AP will be able to decipher what is it and communicate appropriately. And one of the other concept is the uh, trigger wait time. So this is one of the uh, key feature in uh, uh, power saving and uh, scheduling and all those stuff. So typically, right? Wi-Fi had this concept of uh, a CSMA CA. That means before any device transmits a packet or any data on the air, it senses the medium and sees whether the medium is free. If the medium is not free, then it will back off and wait for the medium to be free and only then transmit. Now, uh, this has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. But as part of TWT, what happens is now AP has a control. AP will tell to the device, look, I will tell you when you have to transmit. So that is the, oh, I mean, that is a broad idea of uh, how the TWT works. So there is a trigger wake time. So device will wake up at that particular time, transmit the data and again go back to sleep. So even from a power saving point of view, right? If you take all the end devices, say all the IoT device or your mobile phone or any of these uh, uh, end user devices, they are all power uh, sensitive devices. So this is one of the key feature which will end up saving uh, more power for the uh, IoT kind of devices. Then one more thing which happened is uh, in uh, US, uh, the regulatory authority opened up the 6G spectrum. When I say 6G, it is called as the Uni 5, 6, 7, 8 bands. That means the spectrum from, from 5.9 gigahertz to 7.1 gigahertz that was opened up for Wi-Fi, of course, with some restriction. So the advantage of this was it was like almost a 1.2 gigahertz of spectrum which was opened up. And one of the thing, if you see here, right, 160 megahertz, even though there was a channel bandwidth of 160 megahertz, in 5G, there was there were few channels which were shared with the weather radar and all those stuff. 
those channels couldn't be used freely by the Wi-Fi. In case there was any radar traffic and all, the Wi-Fi had to back off and stop communicating on those channels. So as a result, even though the channel bandwidth was 160, there was hardly one channel which was available in the entire 5G band for 160 megahertz. But now with this 6 gigahertz band open, which is called as Wi-Fi 6E, we can have multiple 160 megahertz channel open and it's a huge 1.25 gigahertz now available for Wi-Fi operation. Of course, not in all countries. Uh, uh, this is at least available in US and in some few more countries. I don't think in India it's still available yet, at least. I may be wrong here, but to the, to the best of my information, this is not still available in India. So that is the other thing which uh, was opened up as part of Wi-Fi 6E. This was like an addendum to Wi-Fi 6. Uh, then coming to the current uh, topic, Wi-Fi 7. So here, if you see, again, the simple thing, the bandwidth again got doubled from 160 megahertz to 320 megahertz. And uh, if you see the uh, year at which it is going to be, the final draft is going to come out is 2024. That doesn't mean that uh, you will not see the chip development. Everything is already started and uh, all the companies have announced their chips based on draft, uh, the current uh, drafts which are there. So we will be talking in detail about the uh, features in the subsequent slides. Uh, I just mentioned a couple of them here, but we will go through in detail in the later slides. Uh, hopefully this is clear, right? So I'll, in case there are any questions, I can take it here or we can proceed to the next slides. Thanks, Sudhir, for that uh, good overview of the history of Wi-Fi. Any questions from anyone at this point? Okay, you can carry on, I think. Yeah, so now coming to the timeline of Wi-Fi 7, uh, again, so Wi-Fi 7, if you see, it approximately started around uh, 2018. Uh, so this IEEE has this TIG or technical information uh, group or something. And so the, they form up uh, groups and uh, each of them feed to the this thing. Uh, so uh, EHT SIG, that is the EHT SG is the main uh, uh, study group which uh, was responsible uh, from where this TGB took, took on. So yeah, and uh, this Wi-Fi 7 is also called as 11B. So uh, EHT is, is, I mean, the phi is called as EHT enhanced high throughput phi. So that's why this study group was called as enhanced high throughput study group. From here it started. And currently, if you see, the draft 2.0 is available. So typically by draft 2.0, most of the things uh, which are there for phi and uh, Mac hardware are finalized and there will be only minor changes going forward. But uh, this is how the timeline from the IEEE currently looks like. Now coming to the benefits of Wi-Fi 7, um, I'll just tell the benefits because when I tell the features, right, uh, I'll again maybe revisit this slide or I'll try to map it to each of these benefits, how each feature is mapping to each, uh, each of the benefits which are mentioned here, right? The first thing is uh, higher data rate. Uh, when I say higher data rate, uh, so as I said, right, I mean, one is it's just the raw bit rate which is there for this particular, which this particular standard supports. It is almost uh, 4.5, uh, or yeah, slightly higher than 4.5 times higher than 11AX. So 11AX was supporting up to 9 gigabits approx approximately. This is roughly around 45 or 46 gigabits per second. That is the kind of data rate which this supports. Then higher spectrum efficiency. When we say higher spectrum efficiency is uh, given the same spectrum, can we transmit more data in the same spectrum? So we achieve this by packing more bits into the same subcarriers and uh, other techniques. So those we will come to in the subsequent slides. So this is the second advantage and uh, lower latency. This is 
one more uh, thing because if you see some of the current application like gaming or uh, other uh, user uh, inter- interface experience right latency is one of the key things which is there and uh, 557 tries to address this uh, uh, tries to lower the latency of the uh, user experience then better interference mitigation so even though we have uh, what you call bigger channels now 160 megahertz 320 megahertz and all those stuff if there is interference in the channel so what happens is then the content of the channel starts getting lost now how do you uh, deal with the interference in a better way uh, there are some schemes in wifi 7 which will help us in uh, dealing with this interference in a much better manner compared to what is done in the previous standards of course higher capacity is related to both data rate and uh, spectrum efficiency and power efficiency also increases because now uh, see one of the ways we increase power uh, efficiency is by Uh, ensuring that the device uh, doesn't uh, go into active mode for a longer time so the easiest way to save power right is to make device go into a lower state lower power state for and make it stay there for as long as possible and so one of the key things which we do this is by saying that the device wakes up for a very short period of time and this is one of the things which is achieved in wifi 7 and uh, of course network efficiency and uh, increased reliability so one uh, uh, increased reliability is when uh, the two devices are communicating with each other is there any way by which we can increase the reliability of the communication in case the channel goes bad or any such thing happens uh, there are ways in uh, methods in wifi 7 uh, whereby the reliability can be increased of the communication so we'll uh, address each of these points and and link it to the features of wifi 7 in the subsequent slides now coming to the key features of wifi 7 uh, the first thing as i mentioned before is the 320 megahertz channel bandwidth so if you remember it was 160 megahertz in case of wifi 6 and uh, if you go back to the wifi 11g 11n 11g 11e and all it was 20 megahertz so we have come a long way from there to up to 320 megahertz channel bandwidth and if you see here one of the thing which this aids is the higher data rate and higher capacity right so because as i mentioned earlier right the shannon's theorem just you can if the bit rate is directly proportional i mean the channel capacity is directly proportional to the bandwidth of the channel the next is the 4k qam or 4096 qam uh, modulation so what this uh, i have a, a, a next slide on this which uh, will try to explain the qam modulation in slightly more detail but what this means is now each sub carrier in the wifi will be able to carry up to 12 bits compared to say earlier where it was up to 1024 qam that is up to 10 bits now we can carry up to 12 bits each sub carrier so imagine in case of 20 megahertz channel there can be 20 megahertz channel has 256 sub carriers and 80 megahertz channel has 1024 sub carriers so on and so forth so as your bandwidth increases the number of sub carriers is increasing and as a result of higher qam the number of bits in each sub carrier can carry is also increasing so what if you see the data rate as a result of these two will just keep trending upwards right then as i mentioned earlier right there was something called as mimo if you see in 11n it started with 4 4 plus 4 mimo that means you the transmit side can have up to four antennas in the 11n standard but now in uh, 11b standard or Uh, Wi-Fi 7, the both the transmit and receive side can have up to 16 antennas. I mean, 16 spatial streams can be transmitted at the same time. So this is the advantage of spatial multiplexing. And if you see, this will not only improve your data rate, but spectrum efficiency will be really, really good. 
and uh, even in terms of power consumption because now you are tra- you are able to communicate with more devices at the same time all those stuff will uh, really improve your power savings also and one of the key features i mean these are all if you take the first three are more or less like enhancements over the existing features because the channel bandwidth was already at 160 the qam was already at 1024 and uh, 8 cross 8 was supported in uh, 11 ac but now these are the new features for example multi-link operation is one of the key features which has been introduced in wi-fi 7. we'll uh, talk about in detail about this feature uh, later but uh, uh, these three multi-link operation so um, multi-ru and preamble puncturing are the uh, these three features are something which are very new in uh, wi-fi 7 and as mentioned earlier uh, Wi-Fi 7 is uh, it's able to operate in all three uh, bands, 2G, 5G, and 6G bands. That means it operates in the two. When I mention when I uh, say 2G band, it refers to the spectrum in 2412 megahertz to 2484 megahertz. It has uh, up to 13 channels, and uh, there is overlap between the st- channels, but this 80 megahertz spectrum is what we refer to as 2G spectrum. And 5G spectrum, when we refer to, is the spectrum between 5180 megahertz to 5825 megahertz. And 6G band, when I mention, when I is mention here, it is from 5925 to 7125 megahertz. So this is the uh, bands which we are, which the Wi-Fi can operate on. And as part of Wi-Fi 7, it applies to all three bands. It can operate in all three bands. And um, one of the key things in any Wi-Fi standard till now is it has backward compatibility. That means it will be able to support a device which is of older standard. For example, even though your router say is of Wi-Fi 7 and you have a 11B device or 11N device, which is an old standard device, it will still be able to support it. So that is one of the key features of Wi-Fi. So, or if uh, the device is Wi-Fi 7 and the router is a old uh, router, even then it will be still able to communicate with the router. But of course, you will not get the full benefits of Wi-Fi 7. But it's not that it is total. It will be incompatible. It will be fully compatible. The only thing is you will not be able to get the ad- uh, advantages of the new technology. Yeah, now coming to the QAM. So uh, just to, uh, uh, for the benefit of people who don't, uh, I mean, just to give a very uh, basic idea of what QAM means, uh, maybe I'll start with this feature on the uh, bottom left. So uh, this is the basic for QAM. That means if you see here, right, uh, imagine a complex number. The X axis is the real part and Y axis is the imaginary part. So if you have to, uh, represent this uh, uh, grid, right? I mean, the, these four points. So you can represent it using one bit on the x axis, one bit on the y axis, right? So in your subcarrier, at uh, each subcarrier at a maximum, it can carry two, two bits one bit on the x axis, one bit on the y axis. The x axis is called in phase, and uh, y axis is called quadrature phase. So this is what is called as 4QAM. Now, if we come from 4QAM to 16QAM, here what happens? The x-axis can carry two bits and y-axis can carry two bits. So that means each subcarrier can, uh, because imagine each subcarrier is carrying one complex number. So that means each subcarrier can has to carry four bits here, two bits on the real part, two bits on the imaginary part. So if you keep expanding this right now coming to 1024 com here what happens if you see here here you are actually going to use 10 bits in each subcarrier right so that means if you see the x axis and y axis both of them can represent up to 10 10 levels now coming to 4096 com here what happens here it is 
four times more denser than 1024 coulomb. Here what happens is you have 4096 points and your x axis and y axis together I mean can carry up to 12 uh, bits of information. So if you compare to say 4 quam to 4096, the spectrum, I mean the constellation starts getting more and more denser. That means the information which can be carried in each subcarrier, the number of bits which can be carried in each subcarrier is growing exponentially, right? Here it is hardly one, uh, two bits, here it will be 12 bits, right? So that's how you can think of it, uh, think of QAM as, right? So there are challenges when we go to higher QAM because here, if you take uh, the simplest case of four QAM, right? Because when we say we are transmitting over the air, inevitably there will be some noise. So if there is a noise added, right? We have a whole lot of margin. That means if you have to say how whether whatever was transmitted, whether it was this point or this point, we have a huge gap between these these two points. That means even if the noise comes up to here, I, as long as it's a positive value on the x axis, I will classify it as this point. But in case of say for uh, 1024 quam itself, if the noise added is this much, then I will be actually I, decoding it as some other information compared to what was actually sent. So that means the transmit side has to be really good to transmit either 1024 or 4096 quam. What this means is the, uh, the radio and the phi have to be really much more uh, sophisticated compared to say the lower quams to have to do this 1024 and uh, 4k quam modif uh, modulation. Right. So uh, this is one of the main things as far as uh, the QAM modulation is concerned. So uh, so from a data rate enhancement point of view in Wi-Fi 7, uh, the first of obviously is the 160 megahertz to 320 megahertz uh, is the uh, first enhancement. Of course, 320 megahertz, I think you, it can only be used in 6G band. And the uh, second thing is on the modulation, which I just explained. Uh, 1k quam to 4k quam and this requires higher signal to noise ratio because as I mentioned right as if the noise starts becoming higher and higher we'll, we'll uh, our decoding will become a uh, problem and it will start end up, uh, decoding it wrongly and the number of spatial streams as I mentioned is uh, has increased from 8 to 16. So here I've just put a uh, pictorial diagram of how it can be as a 16 uh, spatial streams. Of course, this was taken from Prod and Squad's uh, page. Um, so here, if you see, for example, this K and this AP, there are four streams going in parallel. So the AP in this case is communicating with five devices. And each device, it is using multiple streams. For example, this day it is communicating using two streams, and this one is with four streams. Similarly, with two streams with this day, so on and so forth. So the advantage of this is, one is your modem can communicate with many more devices at the same time, because say now with the number of Wi-Fi devices in the house also exponentially increasing, right? Because in the US, I think now, they say each household has like more than 10 or up to 20 devices which use Wi-Fi. So your AP needs more and more, I mean, has a, uh, should have more ability to communicate with multiple devices in a more efficient manner at the same time. So this is one of the key features there. And this helps in improving the data rate of the device also. So as I mentioned, ultimately as a result of all these three, what happens is if you see Wi-Fi 6, the maximum supported throughput was 9.6 gigabits per second. Now, in case of Wi-Fi 7, the maximum data rate which can be supported is 46 gigabits per second. So it's almost like a 4.8 times higher throughput. Imagine when the Wi-Fi started, it was around 2 megabits per second in around 2000 and when OFDM was brought into Wi-Fi, the maximum bitrate supported was 
54 megabits per second. Now we are talking about 46 gigabits per second. That's the maximum data rate which is supported. It doesn't mean that all the devices will be able to support it, but this is if you take the top notch device with all the features taken care, this is what it can go. Now coming to the next feature on multiple RU and uh, preamble puncturing. So um, as I mentioned, right, we have higher channel bandwidth, 160 megahertz, 320 megahertz and all those stuff. Now what happens if you have some kind of interference coming in one of the 20 megahertz channels? So if this, if you take this 320 megahertz channel, right? So you can think of it as like a split up of multiple 20 megahertz channel combined. Right, that's you can just imagine in that way. So if that is the case, say you have some interference in one of the 20 megahertz channel. So in this case, if you just keep transmitting this entire 320 megahertz uh, uh, bandwidth, what you will see is your data received will be corrupted. So to prevent that, what Wi-Fi 7 came up with is something called as preamble puncturing. So the way we uh, send the preamble, right? The, some, the preamble is something which we send it at the start of the packet to say, okay, these are the sub uh, 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 sub bands which we are going to transmit it. So even if you take 80 megahertz or 160 megahertz or 320 megahertz, the way Wi-Fi treats it as it is a combination of multiple 20 megahertz channels. So each 20 megahertz is called as one sub band. So now it will say the when the communication happens between AP and the stay, it will tell that look one of the sub band has an interference. So this sub band will not be used and the other sub bands will be used. So as a result, the, when the when this is a priori communicated in the uh, preamble itself. So now the device also knows that other device also knows the receiving device also knows that whatever data it is going to get is only in the in the sub bands which are not uh, impacted by the uh, interferer. So it will get uh, the data in only these sub bands and these sub bands and not in the affected sub band. So as a result, even though there is interference, you can still use the rest of the bandwidth and communicate effectively with between the devices. And so why was this not possible as part of uh, say 11 AC? Because this uh, uh, amalgamation of channels and combining of channels is all common in 11 AC also, right? But one of the thing which 11 AC didn't allow is this multiple are used to a single device. So the way 11 AC says is if the AP is communicating with the device, the device can only be addressed using one resource uh, unit or one uh, resource unit is nothing but a uh, grouping of sub carriers. So it can, the resource unit can be of different size. It can be a group of 26 uh, sub carriers or it can be a group of 52 continuous sub carriers or it can be a group of 484 uh, uh, continuous sub carriers, but it's a grouping of some continuous sub carriers. It, this, that is how resource unit is defined and it can only be one resource unit per device in case of 11 AC. Now, in case of uh, Wi-Fi 7, what happened was that restriction was removed. Now we can have multiple resource unit to the same device. So as a result, we can do uh, preamble puncturing and say this is one resource unit and this particular spectrum is another resource unit, even though they are all going to the same device. So this is going to improve the way we deal with the interference in the as part of Wi-Fi 7. And uh, coming to the key features of uh, Wi-Fi 7, it is the multi-link uh, operation which uh, which happens. So this is um, uh, think of it as a feature where you have multiple uh, data pipes going between the AP and the state, right? So you may say, what is the big deal here? You can as well have it in the previous standard also. You just use three devices. Now, in this case, you have a say one device and 
even your top layer if you see the uh, uh, standard uh, networking stack right if you come be, until mac everything is same in the stack right only the upper mac even upper mac is same i mean mac is now divided into two upper mac and lower mac so what happens is the upper mac ge gets the traffic from the higher layers and it can so it has multiple options so it has like now it has it sees that okay i can either send the data to the other side in either channel 1 channel 2 channel 3 which channel it has to it can it has to send is based on which channel is free for instance uh, i'm just i've just given as an example here assume we selected one channel in 2g band one channel in 5g band one channel in 6g band so the uh, upper mac gets the, a data which has to be transmitted it queries all three and it finds that 5g band is free now this particular channel is free so it just directly sends the data in this file in this uh, particular band in this channel sorry so as a result what happens is your latency is lower because earlier what used to happen a, a communication between the ap and the stay was always on a single band it can either be in 2g band 5g band 6g band any of the bands but it was always on one single channel now what happens is you have multiple channels from which you can choose from and whichever channel is free you can send the data on that particular channel so that is what is called as multi link operation right so and this reduces your latency also to a very large extent because say for example you choose one particular channel and that was busy for some specific reason some particular reason then you are stuck there so your latency is increasing but now in this case you instead of one channel you have like multiple options so you are latency will start improving because you will send whichever channel is free right so that is one of the uh, key features which is there present as part of uh, wifi 7 and others uh, use maybe like you can send a duplicated data in two channels which will like you are using instead of one channel use use two channels and you send the same data on both the channel uh, both the channels and this will kind of improve your reliability so this is one of the uh, key use cases in uh, wi-fi 7 so Can even for, for implement uh, sudhir can we pause for questions ah yeah yeah please so this multi-link operation is very interesting uh, so today, for example, when I uh, connect to my router in the house, the router supports both uh, 2 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And I have to, uh, I can see two networks on my laptop. Same, same AP, but then it shows uh, either you connect on 5 or you connect on 2. So I choose one of those two uh, to connect. But now you are seeing with the multi-link operation, that uh, differentiation is not required. It can yes. dynamically send on any free channel. Is my understanding correct? Yes, yes, that's exactly the correct thing. So because uh, typically if you like what you mentioned, right now the routers will show you as two different uh, uh, net uh, uh, SSIDs, right? One for 2G, one for 5G kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Even with the same SSID, now you should be able to uh, uh, transmit in multi i mean you uh, basically what you are telling is i don't care which channel you are using but as long as my data goes through so now it's I mean, kind of transparent be... to the user the technology takes Correct. care of that selection Correct. Yeah. second question is uh, we talked about the 320 uh, megahertz of bandwidth is that available mm -hmm. only in the 6 gigahertz band or is it also available in the lower bands See, 2G is out of question because 2G, the entire bandwidth, uh, entire band itself is 80 megahertz. Uh, even if you take exhaust all the channels, 5G, the problem is even though the uh, entire 5G band is from 5180 to 5825, right? Most of the channels are used by the radar or okay. 
all there are multiple uh, country specific restrictions which are coming in many of the for using many of the channels so to get a contiguous 320 is uh, almost not possible in 5 gigahertz 160 itself is extremely difficult i think you mm. will hardly get one 160 megahertz channel in 5 gigahertz so in 6 gigahertz it is possible so 320 megahertz is a possibility only in 6 gigahertz in that Yeah. Only thing is in India, I think they have not delicensed it because a lot yes. of six gigahertz spectrum is used by satellite communications. No, so even it's not in, yet freely uh, for available exa- for Wi-Fi, I believe. Correct. Even in uh, other countries also, uh, if you are using it outside, there are restrictions on using this band. It's uh, the power has to right. be yeah. much uh, below something uh, below some particular uh, threshold and all those stuff. But uh, at least in US, I know it is allowed now. That's okay. Vivek has a question. Vivek, go ahead. Uh, thanks, sir. So one question is uh, currently, if we see 2.4 gigahertz as a greater range and uh, 5 gigahertz as greater speed but lesser range, with uh, mm-hmm. newer generations of Wi-Fi, does the uh, um, Uh, range of uh, 5 gigahertz does it improve or is it going to be the same see one of the main feature which comes to improve your uh, um, improve right is uh, beam forming and multiple streams right because when you are doing beam forming what happens is you are concentrating all the energy in one particular direction you are fo- you are focusing your beam on one side right so your channel gain will start becoming more and more right and if you do beam forming using four uh, four antenna versus two antenna it is even more powerful similarly if you do beam forming using eight that is go- going to have a higher range so that is one of the key ways by which we do we increase the range for example when you do this uh, 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 in uh, the uh, what do you call uh, the 5g the uh, telecom 5g right there you have this concept of small cells and uh, uh, what is it called uh, massive mimo and all those stuff because they operate in like very high frequency 60 gigahertz and all those stuff so there what they do is they do this beam forming using a huge amount of antennas so what is happening is even if you see in wifi the number of antennas i mean what you, the number of spatial streams are increasing and you are doing beam forming with more and more spatial streams as a result your uh, range should start improving that's a very uh, relevant question from vivek so in a sense uh, in 6 gigahertz you have if you look purely from the uh, characteristics of the frequency uh, the range is our coverage is lower compared to say 2 gigahertz but that uh, is somewhat compensated by going uh, for higher spatial streams and streams and beam forming that's my understanding yes yeah that's so path loss is more in 6 gigahertz compared to 2 gigahertz but then uh, uh, some of that path is gained by uh, introducing beam forming and spatial streams and uh, would that beam forming be able to pierce through walls and all or again the obstacles will have a an issue even in beam forming see if the uh, if we are able to if the device is able to receive the signal right so the way, typically in the way beam forming works in, in wifi world is when the ap will send a what do you call as a ndp packet which is like the stay will i mean the device will receive it And 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 based on that channel, uh, based on that packet, it will send the channel information back to the AP. That means how is the uh, path from AP to stay looking like? What is the characteristic of that? And AP, I mean the router when it sends the next packet, which is beam formed, will make use of this information and send it appropriately. That's called the channel state information and all the stuff. So the channel state information is sent back from the device to the uh, uh, ap or the router and using this channel state information it is uh, sending the next packet right 
so even if there are obstacles the channel will reflect it so and since the ap is aware of the channel it will ensure that it is modulated appropriately and it doesn't need line of sight is it for uh, beam no. forming typically mimo is better off if you don't have line of sight because the problem with line of sight is you don't have any diversity so if you have line of sight if you have two antennas transmitting and two antennas receiving right or assume you have two antennas transmitting and one antenna receiving so both the antennas will look very similar if you have line of sight but if you have if you are not in line of sight the channels which are coming from i mean the path which it is taking from both the antennas which are transmitting is going to be different so you have spatial diversity which is coming into picture see the whole uh, premise on which mimo is based on is spatial diversity right if you have full line of sight then your spatial diversity is much lesser so the impact of your mimo becomes lesser so you are better off not having so much uh, of line of sight in mimo case yeah thanks mr yeah uh, nothing to do with so many details but yeah please excuse me if i'm using asking a trivial question is there any relationship between this 2g 4g operate and uh, this wifi or there no they are totally different um uh, wifi is a parallel standard uh, uh, 3gpp is the one which controls the i mean that is the one which comes up with this 5g and uh, uh, 4g 5g and all what you hear as part of uh, the telecom spectrum right this is right. uh, done by ieee the wifi standards uh, which is called as 802.11 standard that is done by ieee this goes in parallel uh, so yeah some of the terminologies which i have used here may be slightly confusing here when i say 2g it is referring to the 2g spectrum band 5g means 5g spectrum band and 6g means 6g spectrum band not the technology per se unfortunately so even, yeah, even there also it is 5g now 6g is coming they are no, going in the same it does, uh, it, no no correct there they, uh, this is that is not referring to the spectrum it is referring to the technology itself so 5g is a technology there here when okay. i say 5g it is the spectral band this is the frequency which we are using so i tend to always uh, use the terms 2 gigahertz i make it explicit instead of j- just yeah. saying 2g yeah, I, I say 2 gigahertz 5 gigahertz and so on so then there is less room for confusion correct right and also anyway, yes, to but... add to sudhir's uh, reply uh, for, to nagendra's question there is one particular overlap uh, that is to say wifi operates on uh, unlicensed bands whereas uh, cellular standards like 4g 5g they operate on licensed bands but then uh, within 5g there is a provision that uh, uh, 5g can also operate on unlicensed band so uh, that is called 5g u so when that happens you know if 5g sees that there is a certain band typically used by wifi which is not being used then 5g can take over and start transmitting in that band so that is now allowed in the 5g standard of course there was resistance to this from wifi uh, community but then wifi still has the priority if 5g devices see that the channel is occupied then they will not use those channels but if they see that the channel is free even though they are like unlicensed channels typically used by wifi they can use it so there is one overlap there where unlicensed bands typically used by wifi can be used by 5g devices right uh, another question is yes you know yeah 2.4 has got a longer range and 5g has got a you know 5 gigahertz has got a shorter range and how about 6 and 7 they are still shorter range or they are better off in the range in theory as your uh, frequency uh, increases right your range starts becoming smaller and smaller oh the child you have bad. to start uh, uh, so you have to start using uh, all this repeater. beam forming and all those stuff yes not repeat beam forming what there are separate um, devices huh? no 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 beam forming is where we use multiple antennas and try to focus the beam like what we are doing here right this picture shows it like we are using four antennas and trying to focus the beam onto one one stick 
So oh. which means, you know, in the house, you know, you will have a, a beam, sir, along with... Uh, Beams in the sense, you, I mean, of course, it's like, it's instead of having one antenna communicating with the device, now you have four antennas communicating with the same device. Think of it in that way. All the four antennas are transmitting. They're transmitting in such a way that the device, even if it is slightly further, it can reach that device because the range of that particular spectrum is lesser to compensate for it. Okay, which means, you know, all this will have more antennas, huh? Yes, typically, that's one of the ways by which we can compensate. But if nothing... But still, you know, range will be antenna. small only, right? Still, range will be small only, right? But if yeah. I can explain a little differently, uh, maybe because you are not from telecom background. See, typically an antenna has a radiation pattern. And uh, there is one main beam which radiates uh, outwards in a particular direction. So let's assume that that beam has a width of uh, 60 degrees. Right, but uh, you know the receiver uh, is in a very particular position which is within the 60 degree uh, sector of radiation. But now what beam forming means is that instead of transmitting at the 60 degree uh, sector, it focuses the energy in a narrower sector, let's say 20 degrees. And because it's focusing the energy, the range gets longer. The pattern which was now broad at 60 degrees, now the energy is focused in a 20 degree uh, sector. So the yes. range is extended. That is beamforming in my understanding. Yes. Okay, but at least I see, I don't know, I respect you of uh... Number of antennas, at least the geo one I see in my house, you know, 2.4, I can see that, you know, every device is able to get it. Uh, but 5, you know, yeah, I can see that, you know, it is diminishing very fast. So, in fact, I have a repeater now. Yeah, I mean, if none of the beam forming or anything is used, raw, I mean, if the same kind of techniques are used, you are right. Uh, 2G will be much, uh, 2 gigahertz bands will be much more, uh, I mean, will have a higher range compared to 5 gigahertz. But it all depends on how good the router is going and doing all this beam forming and how good our devices are also on giving the feedback correctly to the router and so on and so forth. Yeah, but raw throughput, I mean, raw range wise, uh, the 2 gigahertz band will have a higher range but speed will be slow right speed will be slower okay thank you yeah this discussion brings out an important point that so far uh, what we have talked about is the theoretical aspects but practically on the field a lot of other things come into play the topography of the environment and then how good uh, the implementation is in your particular access point Maybe TP-Link is better than uh, something else, uh, some other alternative uh, access point, D-Link or, you know, something else. So a lot of other things come into play, how well the implementation is and uh, the environment in which the installation is done. So practically you can when never the, achieve that uh, so-called 46.1 gigabits per yeah. second. And this, this is the raw high level throughput. I mean, we are yeah. not telling about the TCP throughput or the actual application throughput. This is the raw high level throughput. The lowest level is what we are telling here. So Wi-Fi 7 is already launched, is it, in some countries? Or in a sense, so the uh, chip manufacturers have announced their devices, uh, at least few of them like Broadcom, Qualcomm and all those stuff. But the formal final draft will be only out in 2024. Currently, the draft okay. 2.0 is available and uh, most of the things are finalized from a, at least 5 and Mac point of view. But no commercial devices have come out in the market? Currently, no. I don't think any commercial devices come out. Okay, okay. So then we can talk about Wi-Fi 6 instead. So is there practical meaning on the field, real world use case, anybody is achieving 9 gigabits per second i don't think so so what is the yeah. best they are achieving maybe one gigabits per second mm, one 
one gigabits uh, yeah i assist more than that one gigabits because um, okay i'm not anyway, sure just to put for it, thought uh, yeah. yeah it it is good to know like theory promises 9 gigabits per second it's good to know what practically has been proven on the field no i need it's a controlled yeah, environment that, but still some number will be available yes so if you take um, um, wifi 7 itself right if you go to linkedin broadcom has a demo using wifi 7 where they demonstrate uh, 10 gigabits bits per second in their lab using two devices over the oh, air okay okay uh, this is of course wifi 7 not a wifi 6 which they demonstrated but this was their first uh, ap chip they wanted to demonstrate the real i mean over the air performance using uh, their ap chip and uh, that is one of the thing and uh, coming to the throughput discussion right there is one more catch see all the bitrate is fine but when you start increasing bitrate you are also consuming more power so if you are talking about say iot or all the low power use cases Uh, on the small devices right which are not uh, wall powered this we may not be really requiring that kind of huge bit rate and power is one of the considerations which will come into picture and that will also start impacting this and that is something which we need to keep in mind thanks for that clarification yeah and what are the health hazards for this health hazards any health hazards just i am not aware of uh, in that thing, any health hazard as such uh, because it's the typical uh, spectrum which uh, has been used till now at least the 5 up to 5 gigahertz and all uh, i think this been used for uh, years now uh, 6 gigahertz just has opened up but uh, those are also being used by other standards right like what i've been mentioned satellite communication and all are already using 6 gigahertz so i'm not aware of any health hazards uh, uh, to my knowledge at least okay so it is safe to switch them on uh, throughout the night <laughs> sure. at least as i said right i'm uh, okay. i'm not an expert on that but yes sure, sure. thank you i think the jury out there is divided some people will claim there are health hazards others will claim it is safe Uh, can I ask one question? Quick question in that slide which you showed for that uh, spatial uh, multiplexing and uh, the line of sight was still there. So my earlier question here, this this slide, don't no, you see a line a, of sight still here? Uh, uh, no, no, no. This is just a example slide, right? Just to yes, say okay. how the uh, things uh, are working. So it's just okay. that we want to demo. Uh, we are. It's just to say that. Okay, you have multiple stays. Each stay using different amount of streams. One stay using okay. two streams. One stay using four streams. So, so even if there is a reflection, you are saying that it will be fine. It need not be in the line of sight. Even if there is a reflection, uh, it it will still be able to pierce. Through. Okay. Yes, sir. See, yeah. Imagine instead of two, I mean, MIMO and all those stuff, right? imagine if it is a single antenna and uh, you are uh, using your wifi device at home there will be reflections mm. right and that is anyway taken care as part of uh, the our uh, wifi receiver any standard wifi receiver understands that there will be reflections and there are uh, there are uh, there will be a channel impairment and all those stuff so that is uh, anyway taken care of because usually See, whenever what? they show any diagram for beam forming it will be like uh, the transmitter and receiver are kind of in that line and it focuses the beam through the shortest path without any reflections so that is why i was asking that question uh, beam forming is uh, okay uh, as i said right any beam forming uh, if if you take so imagine the uh, case it's a so um, the way beam forming works is the ap sees that there are five different paths to the state that is how special i mean beam forming is mainly possible because of special diversity right if 
everything is exactly same then you can send everything at the, through any path it doesn't make any difference so the only reason why beam forming works is there is a special diversity element which is there with the exact line of sight uh, where every channel is exactly behaving similarly beam forming will not be possible yeah i mean i understand why they show it because it's easier to show that this is how you can do but okay. uh, yes i mean uh, okay i'm slightly wrong in the this thing you can do beam forming in line of sight but for mimo uh, we need diversity and even uh, beam forming can be done without line of sight also okay and i don't know whether i can ask this question now or later i'll just quickly ask that so compared with the 5g uh, uh, telecom standard which is uh, touted to be the next uh, industry 4.0 application uh, if when they compare it with wifi they say uh, wireless uh, uh, communication via wifi is not deterministic whereas 5g if you have to use it in the floor where say a big warehouse is there and you have to send uh, uh, drones and all they will say 5g is more effective in the floor management there whereas in wifi the determinism is not guaranteed so what is your thought on that so see traditionally wifi uh, used to use as i mentioned right csmsa that means uh, carrier sends uh, and a carrier access kind of thing that means the device will sense when the medium is free and only then transmit if the medium is free it will transmit so that is what was one of the causes for where you are it was not fully deterministic but now wifi from 11x or wifi 6 time from point of view right it has something called as twd that is target wake time so it is like similar to what some of the features which were there in the uh, uh, 5g and all those stuff right that, that has been taken care so now the ap tells the device that i'm going to talk to you next at this point of time so the scheduling now ap has a much more tighter control over the scheduling of the uh, traffic compared to earlier standards so if your question is on Uh, whether the i mean for example whether the device can uh, will be able to get a scheduled traffic at the uh, exact time at least the twt feature is one which tries to address that topic maybe if i extend it to slice slice is guaranteed in 5g and i'll definitely get a chance rather than ap determining whether i'll get a chance or not i'm always guaranteed here even with uh, this improvement whatever you mentioned in 5g i have this slicing concept i am always guaranteed to go so then uh, the the clashes say there are two robots going and they clash with each other they are never saying wifi can be used in those applications whereas 5g is being uh, pro- i mean it is a promising thing i know but still uh, they never say wifi can be used in that uh, scenario right so right now if you take mlo so that's the reason you have almost like you can have multiple channels so the probability of having all the channels blocked at the same time is negligible right so what you are now telling is you are whatever data or whatever traffic you want to send or whatever command you want to send you can send it in any of the channel so as a result you are not being bothered about any channel being congested right because reserving a channel for one particular device or something is going to be a costly affair because imagine in a given house if you see if you combine all the laptops phones pa- pads everything you will have like 20 devices in a house so if each of them you have to allocate a specific bandwidth which is dedicated it is not going to be very optimal right so as a result you will in this what the proposal which is coming is like you have multiple channels open to communicate with between devices whichever is free you go and communicate on that yeah thank you
Yeah, I guess you can carry on with your slides if there yeah. are any more. Yeah, the last one. Um, so even though we mentioned about uh, multi-link operation, so there are different uh, device types even here in multi-link operation. The top, I mean the uh, uh, the one which is the most powerful and the one which uses which can utilize the full power of multi-link operation is called the STR. That is simultaneous transmit receive device. Here you will have multiple radio chains like what we have shown here and all of them uh, can do transmit and receive at the same time. So there is no constraint in terms of STR device. Now in terms of lowest power, say for example, we have IoT market which is very cost sensitive and power sensitive. We can't go and start putting STR radio which will just bulk up the cost as well as the power. So in this case, what we do is we have a single radio which can do transmit and receive at the same time. But what happens is based on the uh, uh, based on one of the packets, we will start switching between links in uh, within the uh, within real time so that it appears like we have multiple links active at the same time. So it even though there's only one active link at a given time, but it will be like a switch. The radio will be switching between two links in a uh, in uh, in a fast manner. And but it will be a single radio. This is called as MLSR. Then the next one is the device. Again, if you have a AP or the router of router, it has to be mandatorily STR. This is only for the device. So device can be a MLSR like what I mentioned. The second option is device can can be a EMLSR. EML, EMLSR again, it is uh, only option for device, not for an AP. So in this case, it can listen on both two channels or four channels or how many ever channels, but it can only transmit on uh, using one radio. So that radio can keep switching frequencies. So as a result of this, imagine because your AP is the one which is determining which channel to use. In that case, you can uh, you know which channel it is using to communicate and immediately you switch your transmit radio to that particular channel to transmit the frame. So that is called as EMLSR. And the next one is non STR MLMR. That means here you have multiple radios, but you can't, there are restrictions on using the uh, doing transmit and receive on these multiple radios. That means uh, there, the transmit and receive should have some, if you are doing it simultaneously, you can't have channels next to each other having uh, doing uh, uh, you are not you can't do transmit and receive on two different channels which are next to each other at the same time similarly when you are doing tx you can't do rx on the same channel so there there are some restrictions which are there compared to str so this is the third, uh, fourth kind of device so these are the four types of devices which are there as per as uh, as part of standard which uh, the standard uh, defines for multi-link operations. So this is mainly required for the device. For an AP, again, as I mentioned, it has to be a STR. It can't be any of this. Yeah, and uh, that brings me to the end of the session. Uh, yeah, any questions or any uh, clarifications needed? One question which came to my mind, multi-link operation, who decides which uh, channel to use? Is it the AP or the station? No. That is uh, when the uh, the, uh, the stay connects to the station uh, AP, right? There is the negotiation which happens on the capability and the channels to use for the ML also. So it is uh, done as a part of initial uh, uh, um, uh, connecting to the AP itself. Okay, okay. And after that, when if in case say the AP wants to change a channel, it will uh, communicate uh, to the device by having a, sending a specific packet saying, okay, we are switching channel to this. This particular link is being switched and all this stuff. Then the device can uh, update the AP about the status of one particular link. So you are saying the initial CSMA CA is still holding good 
and uh, at that point the station will decide okay i'm going to try contention on this particular channel so typically right when uh, uh, when the uh, device connects to the network for example you are connecting your phone to your router right there will be a negotiation which happens on which channel the phone will communicate with the router right in case of multilink operators it will not be a single channel it will also communicate whether the device is mlo capable or not if it is mlo capable which are the bands in which it is mlo capable and even the ap will say okay it is mlo capable and it can support these these channels so based on that it will the device in the ap will negotiate i mean as part of uh, network joining itself it will communicate how many channel how many links to be used and uh, what are the capability of the device and all those stuff are as part of the initial joining process got it but uh, let's say after the initial joining hmm. let's say the uh, client device is idle for some time and then it has some hmm. packet to send at that time it is the device that decides now which channel to send on yes because ap remember is always str that is okay. ap can uh, which channel in the sense is i'm assuming they have already negotiated some three yeah, channels yeah. Uh, which they can uh, uh, negotiate uh, they can uh, talk to so ap is always str that means it has to in ensure that all the rx are active right but for a stay all these are optional it can have so uh, the implementing an ap will become more complex isn't it if it has to Correct. support Correct. that is always um, the case in uh, yeah. uh, in wifi right because uh, ap has to be Uh, because the assumption is ap is wall powered and you can spend yeah. more power and uh, you can put more intelligence there and uh, the radios also can be more powerful okay we Whereas are taking your lot devices of time. are on uh, we can have couple of more questions if anyone has questions uh, like in mlo uh, if the client connects in a 2g band so is it as good as it is connected in 5g and 6g band or they will there be requirement to have a separate connection in 5g as well as in 6g bands so as part of connection itself right when yes. we say mlo connection it is which are the uh, which for example when when we say mlo we are connecting a device to the ap uh, in a mlo operation right so it will the ap and the stay will negotiate which are the three links or i mean how many ever links are possible say only two links are possible in this case so the ap and the stay will also negotiate which are these two links which are the channels in which these two links operate on because in case of wifi right the ap has to keep sending beacons on a and any one of the links and the device has to keep receiving the beacon if the if beacons are not received by the device or ap is stop sending beacons the connection between the ap and the device will get broken as part of standard itself right so that is so the which are the channels which are to be used for each of the link and how many links are there between device and the ap is decided at the time of joining itself okay, in fact if the device can have if anyone has uh one quick question i will ask uh, this this uh, wifi calling where uh, we use uh, a wifi last mile to a mobile phone and later on it goes and uses the uh, telecom network would it be the same as uh, voice over ip or it is not the same okay so the next question uh what yeah. i meant is yeah did you get it uh, yeah yeah i got it so basically voice over ip if i think it of in a very simplistic term it's basically you are converting voice to packets and sending it over a 3g network or some network right and uh, the concept as such will be similar i mean instead of sending it over a okay. uh, telecom network you are you are sending it over wifi and then it goes to the network i mean 
terms of at a top level it kind of matches right yeah. i mean what is the key thing in voice over ip it's just that you are converting your voice to a data like packet and sending it over a uh, uh, wireless network that is what voice over ip is right or that's been my understanding yeah maybe arvind uh, if you have any addition yes yeah, so here voice over wifi it actually uses the telecom network still right uh, through the uh, router but it will still touch the telecom service provider only so then i think yeah it will switch back to the normal network only the last mile delivery is over ip and everything else is yeah. via the telecom network yeah. okay that gateway some gateway will be there right in the middle for it to work yeah i can answer so, that uh, okay okay yeah so i think we'll come to the end of the, come to the end of the session uh, sudhir you can uh, unshare your screen i'll share my screen to conclude yeah just a minute yeah. uh, you guys can see my screen yes Yeah. Yeah. So today's session was this Wi-Fi seven by Sudhir, and we have many more sessions planned. Uh, so tomorrow we have a session uh, by Ramanathan on time series feature engineering. Uh, so all this is being organized as part of our Engineers Day celebrations. We are actually celebrating these three specific days: nine September, thirteenth, and fifteenth. Okay, couple of articles I want to highlight, which are published on Devopedia. Since we have been talking about Wi-Fi, there is a nice overview on uh, 11ax. So those who want to read about 11ax in greater detail, you can go through this article. And if you click on this particular tag, WLAN, you can also see what are the other Wi-Fi related articles which are published. So one of the articles is Wi-Fi calling, which uh, I think uh, someone was asking. so you are talking about uh, making reference to will it go through a particular gateway and all that so more detail is available here in this particular article and you can see the call originates from a device goes through wifi but finally it joins the cellular network so this is a packet gate uh, p gateway and then the e pdg so this is a uh, voice over lt uh, this is voice over wifi so you can take a look at this this article explains in detail what is wifi calling and there are other articles Thanks. on wifi yeah, local area network 11 ad tip open wifi 11 ac wifi performance testing wifi mac layer wifi direct wifi security so these are the articles on wifi that we have published on uh, devopedia unfortunately we don't have anything on uh, wifi 7 that is uh, 11 be uh, if anyone is interested you can write that article and uh, it will get published so as a last point i want to mention uh, i have a friend who is an expert in wifi and he is also closely connected to ieee so he just put out a message on linkedin saying that uh, ieee has just started uh, the work for wifi 8 so uh, yeah uh, by the time it comes to a certain stable draft it may take another 2 years and maybe another 2 years from there before a commercial product comes out so anyway the work has just started on wifi 8 uh, since i got the message on linkedin i thought of sharing it with you guys so thank you so much sudhir for that interesting talk it was packed with details but also not too technically difficult for people to follow So I think it was an enjoyable talk. Talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Arvind. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Sudhir.